Uh, We are in the middle of a series walking through the book of Ruth, and so if you've got a Bible and a pen, I need you to grab those two things. I need you to go to Ruth chapter 2, Ruth chapter 2, and then while you're turning there, uh, I'm going to put some uh, verses up on the screen. It's out of Psalms chapter uh, 26, and these verses will really set up where we're going today. And so, um, yeah, I think I'm going to do this. And so I wrestled with doing this idea, but I'm going to give it a shot, and so if this works at 9, it'll make the cut at 11. If not... You just killed this idea, all right? So the idea, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to read this together out loud. So typically I read this and then pray. So we're going to read this together out loud. I think there's something powerful about the body of Christ reading uh, God's word together. So we'll read it together out loud and I'll pray for us and we'll dive into the message. So here's Psalm 26, verse 9 through 12 it says this. Don't let me suffer for the fate of sinners. Don't condemn me along with murderers. Their hands are dirty with evil schemes, and they constantly take bribes. But I am not like that. I live with integrity. So redeem me and show me mercy. Now I stand on solid ground, and I will publicly praise the Lord. That definitely is making the cut at 11. Thank you guys so much. That's awesome. Hey, let me pray for us. Jesus, I thank you for uh, being here in your spirit here this morning and Through the music, God, I I pray that as we study God's word, that the scripture would just weigh heavy on our hearts and minds and souls. Lord, I pray that in this moment, you begin to soften people's hearts, that you would begin to soften people's minds, that all the walls and barriers begin to break down, and that we'd be ready to hear and and see and receive whatever you'd have to show us today. Lord, I pray for the kids and students in the rooms behind us. Lord, I pray that as, as their uh, volunteers, God, are discipling them, God, that the Holy Spirit would move back in those rooms. Lord, continue to bless and guide and lead our church. Lord, we will follow you every step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, one of our four kids, and I will try to keep uh, his name anonymous. Uh, I said his name. So one of the kids is removed. So... Uh, <laughs> got eliminated. So of my three boys, um, one of them uh, has a usually uh, grumpy mood, might be a bit of an exaggeration, but he's always complaining. He's always slightly irritated about life. Things bother him, the littlest of things. He comes home from school. He's just always going, well, this bothered me. They didn't say this. They acted this way. He's just kind of irritated constantly with life of, of just the littlest, smallest things. And so almost on a daily basis, he'll come home and he'll tell me and Brianna, just like things that bothered him, that irritated him, what this person did or they didn't do. And I'm listening and Brianna's listening. And then when he finishes Brianna does, you know, what, you know, a great mom would do. She goes, I hear you. And she goes, why don't you tell me three positive things that happened in your life today? And he has to like think through it. And then he like lists three positive things. And he goes on about his day. When he leaves, you know, I just kind of sit there and I'm listening and he walks away and I tell Brianna, I go, hey, babe. She goes, what? I go, you know, he does have a point. Those things he mentioned are super irritating. They're frustrating. Like, I can see his point. And she goes, you know why you can see his point, don't you? (laughs) I was like, no, why? She goes, because he is a carbon copy of you. You're irritated by everything. All these little things bother you as well as they bother him. And I paused. I was like, well, great minds do think alike. I like, and, I, and, I, and I say it because you have met parents before, I'm confident, and then you've met their kids, and especially if their kids are older, like, you know, later high school or college or maybe even young adult kids, and you meet the kids, and that son or daughter, just by the way they act or talk or their demeanor or the way they physically look or their facial expressions, or even by the way they walk, like, it reminds you of their mom and dad. And so especially if you meet the son and daughter after you've met mom and dad and you meet son or daughter and they go, hey, so-and-so are my parents. You're going, oh yeah, I knew that. Like that's obvious just by the way you talk, by the way you act, by the way you carry yourself. I know that when I see you, I absolutely think about your mom and dad because of these characteristics and these traits. And today we're going to look at a, at a character in this story of Ruth and the character's name is Boaz and he would be the family redeemer for both Ruth and Naomi. Now today... When we look at Boaz and as the family redeemer, and when I say the fam- word family redeemer, what that would mean uh, back in these days would be, he would be the person that would have the financial means, the influence, the wherewithal 
to purchase back somebody's freedom, to rescue somebody or someone that is in a, a dire situation to provide them safety and security, to give them protection and provisions. He would be the family redeemer. And he does this for, for both Ruth and Naomi. Now, when we look at Boaz today, what I need it for it to do in your mind and in my mind is when we look at Boaz, the redeemer, I need for it to remind us of Jesus as our redeemer. So when we look at Boaz, you're going to see he's called a family redeemer. We're going to see a Ruth and Naomi kind of approach Boaz. When you and I read Boaz and his redemption, not only this week, but, but next week of Ruth and Naomi, I need for it to jog our memory, to really turn our attention to Jesus as our redeemer. And so today we're going to look at that. We're going to look at Ruth and Naomi, uh, how they interacted with, with Boaz as the redeemer. And I need it for it to lay on us, like how you and I interact with our redeemer Jesus. Now, let me just be very, very clear. Boaz, he's not Jesus. He's, he's a dude. He's a family redeemer. But you'll see this throughout the Old Testament, that there would be pictures of, 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 that would point our hearts and minds to Jesus. This would be one of them. This is Boaz, the family redeemer, the kinsman redeemer. He redeems Ruth and Naomi, and it absolutely should point our hearts and minds toward Jesus today. Ruth chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to pick it up in verse 19. If you were here last week, uh, Ruth was out in the fields and she was uh, uh, getting food and gathering for, for her, her mother-in-law, Naomi. Uh, she comes back in verse 19, we'll, we'll pick it up, says this. Where did you gather all this grain today? Naomi asked. Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who helped you. So Ruth told her mother-in-law about the man in whose field she had worked. She said, the man I worked with today is named Boaz. May the Lord bless him. Naomi told her daughter-in-law, he is showing his kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of our family redeemers. And you can underline that, that last little phrase, one of our family redeemers. I need you to notice, if you've been tracking with us the past few weeks, week number one, uh, Naomi was bitter, very, very bitter about life. In fact, she said, no longer call me Naomi, call me Mara, because Mara means bitter. She goes, that best describes me. But as time has gone on, as God has softened her heart, <clears throat> you see that she moves from bitterness to blessing. She goes, bless this, one, this man, bless the things that he has done. The reason why is because he's a family redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, so he would be the one that would have the financial means, that would have the influence, that would have the wherewithal to save Ruth and Naomi, to, to redeem them, to buy back their family and to take them out of poverty and out of harm's way into safety, into protection, into provision. Look what happens, verse 21. It says, then Ruth said, what's more, Boaz even told me to come back and stay with his harvesters until the entire harvest is completed. Good, Naomi exclaimed. Do as he said, my daughter, stay with his young woman right through the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but you will be safe with him. And underline that you'll be safe with him. <clears throat> Verse 23. So Ruth worked alongside the other women in Boaz's field and gathered grain with them until the end of the barley harvest. Then she continued working with them through the wheat harvest and in her early summer, all the while she lived there with her mother-in-law. And that time frame was about four months in between the harvest. Chapter 3, verse 1. It says, one day Naomi said to Ruth, my daughter, it's time that I found you a permanent home for you so that, and underline, you'll be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight, he'll be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Stop right there. First thing I need you to understand and what, what Ruth and Naomi did when it came to their kinsman redeemer, what you and I should certainly do when it comes to Jesus, our redeemer, is simply this, is to acknowledge the need of a redeemer. To acknowledge the need of a redeemer. They both saw, and specifically Naomi pointed out, that Ruth, you and I, we need provision and we need protection. We need somebody to provide for us financially, somebody to provide for us a home. We need somebody to protect us. Boaz is our family redeemer, and they acknowledge that the life that they had could be better, but could only be better through their redeemer. First thing that you and I, when it comes to Jesus, our redeemer, is you and I have to, 
We have to acknowledge that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that we are in need of a Redeemer. There's got to reach this point in your life and in my life in order to receive the redemption of Jesus Christ that you and I come to this point of complete and utter desperation. Like we are out of moves, we are out of options, like this is it. If we don't have a Redeemer, if we don't have a, re- a Savior, then it is, we're going to fall flat on our face. And until you get to that point, until you get to that point of total desperation, you'll never really fully understand it and acknowledge that you need a Redeemer. And, and for some of you, you've been making excuses or for some of you, you've been kind of glossing over things or just kind of putting things on the back burner. I'll deal with it later. It's not that big of a deal. Your life is falling apart. You're a sinner in need of a savior. And at some point you have to come to the realization that, and acknowledge that you need a redeemer. And you don't see Ruth and Naomi going back and forth when Naomi goes, hey, you know, you need to be provided for in safety. Ruth goes, no, it's not that big a deal. I don't mind going out there in the fields. I don't mind doing this. It's not that big a deal. They both realized that they were widows and Ruth is in a foreign country out there, hard labor, uh, not a real safe place to be. Ruth and Naomi both needed that, that understood they needed both a provision and protection from their redeemer. And my hope and prayer today is that if you haven't come to that point in your life, that today you will acknowledge in complete desperation that you are a sinner in need of a savior, that you need provision, that you need protection. And the only answer is Jesus Christ, our redeemer. A few weeks ago, it was Easter Sunday. I don't know if you remember Easter Sunday. It's a kind of a big deal in a uh, preacher's house. Uh, it was a great Sunday. We did church here, and then uh, and I and I went home. Now, in a preacher's family, at least for ours, so Easter Sunday is a big kind of you know chaotic, stressful deal. So we do our Easter meal on Saturday, the day before, and so we we did that Saturday before Easter, and Brianna cooked ham and mashed potatoes, green beans, all all the stuff, and so. Sunday, I come home after church and everything. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. And I'm looking forward to leftovers because there's ham and mashed potatoes and green beans and all the things. And so sure enough, I go home, change out of my church clothes and my comfy clothes, pull out a, a paper plate, and I start putting on ham, mashed potatoes, green beans, that kind of stuff. Now, just one thing you need to know about Brianna is that when it comes to events like that, she always buys fancy paper plates. If you didn't know what a fancy paper plate is, I brought one here. It's this right here. This is a fancy paper plate. He is risen. It's got a little cross on there. Very, very fancy, right? And so I take the paper plate and I put the ham and the mashed potatoes and the green beans and everything. And I throw it in the microwave, push on the timer, and I walk away. (laughs) Where were y'all a few weeks ago? That would have been very helpful (laughs) if you know what is about to happen. Wow, I feel like an idiot. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I really do. I thought most of you would be like, what happened? And I'll be like, well, we know what happened, you idiot. It caught on fire. <laughs> Y'all knew? Okay. Y'all killed this illustration big time. So, yeah, I, I didn't know this, all right? And so for like maybe me and one other dude in the room, uh, there's metal on this paper plate. I throw it in the microwave, turn it on, and walk in there, and all of a sudden, some, smell something burning, obviously, and Brianna's like, what does that smell? I was like, I don't know, I'm microwave or something. She goes, what, did you put it on that plate? I was like, yeah. She goes, did you put metal in the microwave? I was like, no, I'll put it on the paper plate, it's fine. And then that's where she'd light me to where you all know. She goes, there's metal on those, those paper plates. I was like, babe, they don't, they don't put metal on paper plates. That's why they call them paper. She goes, no, on that paper plates, there's little f- embossed foil, and I was like, Who, like, we're arguing back and forth while there's a fire in our microwave. And I was like, no. She goes, go look. Sure enough, I pull it out. Half the plate is burned. I mean, the ham has now got a nice smoky flavor. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Now, I think for so many of us, our lives are on fire and we're arguing why they shouldn't be on fire. 
Like our lives are like in a complete disaster. We're going, no, it's not that big a deal. It wouldn't happen to me. Do you, do you know where I live? Do you know the amount of money that I make? It's not that big of a deal. And our lives are in a complete mess or on fire. And we go, don't worry about it. At some point, you and I have to realize our lives are on fire. We are sinners in need of a savior. We need provision and protection and safety that only comes in the form of Jesus, our redeemer. And this is what Ruth and Naomi came to realize at the very end, Ruth and Naomi go, really, we need provision, we need protection. Boaz is our redeemer. Then look what Naomi tells Ruth. Chapter, uh, chapter three, verse three. Naomi says this, she goes, now, do as I tell you, take a bath and put on perfume and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you until he has finished eating and drinking. Be sure to know us where he lies down. Then go and cover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. Stop right out there. Now, you read that, you go, whoa, Chris, that seems a little PG-13. I've got young kids in here. Easy. It's, it's not that. This is not a sensual act. Uh, what, what Ruth is telling Naomi, or what Naomi is telling Ruth to do, is Ruth is essentially asking Boaz to be her husband. So this is not a sensual act, and, and you're going to see this. This is a coming underneath the submission and asking Boaz to be her husband, to be her family redeemer. Now, remember, Ruth is a Moabite, so she would not know uh, Israelite customs. Uh, Naomi is, and so she's telling Ruth, here's what you need to do. And so Ruth does exactly that, verse 7. After Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end on the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over he was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. Verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz exclaimed. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before, for you have not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. So she approaches Boaz at his feet and asks for his covering. So it's this full and complete submission underneath Boaz. It is with complete humility, without any entitlement, without any manipulation. She is coming and humbling herself with the utmost humility. And she goes, I am your servant. Second thing I need you to understand or think about when it comes to approaching Jesus is simply this, is to approach with humility, the Redeemer. Approach with humility, the Redeemer. She approaches Boaz in a very humble way. You don't see Ruth going, hey, Boaz, you remember me? I've been working in your fields for four months. I'm the one she knows before, really hardworking, moved here from Moab, taking care of, you know, Naomi, my mother-in-law. I think she's kin to you. Uh, what do you think, you know, you know help, help me out. Not, a, not, not that at all. She comes and in the most humble, respectful way, she goes, I am your servant. Now she's asking Boaz to redeem her, asking Boaz to, to be her husband. So there is this approach, but it is with humility, not with manipulation, not with entitlement, not with any presumptive ideas, but as a humble servant coming before her family redeemer going, I need your help. When it comes to approaching Jesus, our redeemer, there cannot be any entitlement. There cannot be any manipulation, any God owes me. There has to be 100% complete humility with submission and surrender. You don't go to a holy, almighty, all-encompassing, sitting on his throne, King Jesus, with some swagger in your step, with your shoulders held back and your chest out because you've done whatever it is you think you've done to deserve it. When you and I approach King Jesus, it is with the utmost humility and surrender. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. All things are created by him, for him, and through him. There isn't this buddy-buddy with King Jesus. 
There isn't, he owes me and gosh, isn't this great? This is complete surrender and humility. Jesus, I'm a sinner in desperate need of a savior, in desperate need of a redeemer. And so when it comes to approaching Jesus, there is this humility, there is this surrender, there is not a single bit of entitlement in our voices. But with Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I know that I'm a a broken, sinful human being. And Jesus, I'm asking you to be my savior, to be my redeemer in the most humble, surrendered way possible. That's what it means to approach with humility, your redeemer. You and I do not come to King Jesus with our shoulders back and our head held high and look at what we've done. We come in full submission and repentance because he's King Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of this in Luke chapter 15. You can read about it later. You know the story. The story we call the story of the prodigal son. It's the famous story. Spoiled little rich kid, thinks he deserves it all, asks daddy for his inheritance. Dad gives it to him. He goes away, spends it all on wild living, and he finds himself feeding pigs in a pig pen. And we often look at that story with like, look at what this kid did wrong. And, And yes, he did a lot of things wrong. But what most people don't realize is that the prodigal son, he actually did a couple of things right. And you can go read in Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 19, the the two things that he did. Number one, it says he's sitting there feeding the pigs and the food looked good. And scripture says, and he came to his senses. Or in other words, he realized, huh, this didn't go as well as I had planned. And then he says, I know I'll go back to my dad and I'll say, dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. Take me on as a hired servant. Or in other words, he was going back to approach his father with complete humility going, listen, I don't even need to be called your son. Just take me on as a hired servant. So there was this acknowledgement of going, listen, I'm feeding pigs. This is not how I thought it would turn out. I need help. I need rescuing. I need saved. I know I'll go back to dad, not as the son, not as the entitled, not as the spoiled brat, but as the servant as the hired servant and he runs back and before he can even say I want to be your servant he gets welcomed home as the son but it's because he returned with complete humility willing to be the servant and you see Ruth approaching Boaz her redeemer with complete humility with submission I am your servant she acknowledged there, there is definitely a need. She needed provision, she needed protection. She approached with complete humility. And then look at what Boaz says. Look at verse 11. And I love this. Verse 11, now don't worry about a thing. And you can align that. Don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary for everyone in town knows you are a virtuous woman. But while it's true that I am one of your family redeemers, there's another man who is more closely related to you than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning I will talk to him. If he is willing to redeem you, very well, let him marry you. But if he is not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. And you can underline that. Now lie down here until morning. So she goes with complete humility. Boaz could have said, absolutely not. What are you doing? Get out of here. And all Boaz says, listen, I will take care of it. There was another family redeemer in line. Boaz is going to let him um, have have the first option. But if he refused, Boaz says, don't worry, you will be redeemed. You will be saved. You will be provided for. You will be protected. Boaz says, I will take care of it in the morning. Do not worry about a thing. There wasn't any question. There wasn't any, well, let me think about it. Let me talk about it. This says, Boaz says, I will redeem you. And then Ruth goes home and tells Naomi what happens. Verse 16. It says, when Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, what happened, my daughter? Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her, and she added, he gave me these six scoops of barley and said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. <laughs> Smart man, right? You go back to your mother-in-law, oh, here, take six, verse 18. And I love this. Then Naomi said to her, just be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens. The man won't rest until he has settled things today. Third thing I need you to understand or write down simply this is to accept the redemption of the Redeemer. To accept the redemption. To acknowledge, first of all, that that you and I are in need of it. To approach Jesus, our Redeemer, with complete humility. And then to accept the redemption of the Redeemer. 
I'll, I'll bow and say, listen, all right, I hear you. Don't worry about a thing. I'm going to take care of it. You don't need to do anything else. I will take care of it. I will resolve it in the morning. And Naomi tells Ruth, don't worry about a thing. Boaz will take care of it. This will happen. You need to understand that when you and I come to our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, there is this thing called grace. And grace, when you understand it, it sounds almost too good to be true. Because when it comes to grace, there isn't anything that you and I can do to earn it or to work for it or to certainly deserve it. It is bestowed upon us because of the love of our Heavenly Father. And so when you and I receive the grace of Jesus Christ and understand what that redemption means for us, you and I just have to accept that by faith. There isn't anything else that you and I need to do to work for, to earn it. You don't have to pray like 10 times and attend church three out of four Sundays and give, you know, 10.1% of your finances. It's just accept the grace of Jesus by, through faith, and that is it. There is no working. There isn't, you don't deserve it. There isn't do these three things. There isn't a checklist that you and I have to do to accept the redemption of Jesus. It's to simply accept it by faith. And Boaz tells Ruth, don't worry about a thing. There's nothing else you need to do. I will handle it. Naomi tells Ruth, don't worry about it. He will handle it. And it's one of those deals that if, if you're on the edge of Christianity or you're here and you're a bit of a skeptic, you're going, man, that sounds a little too good to be true. And the reality is we operate off of uh, if I do A, B, and C, then D always happens. If I do these three steps, then this thing will unlock and I can walk through this door. But that's not the way salvation, that's not the way redemption through Jesus works. It works by grace through faith. And at some point, you just have to say, I don't understand it. I certainly don't deserve it. But by faith, I accept it. Years ago, when we had uh, just three kids, our youngest, Micah, was not born yet. And so our three oldest kids were like preschool and elementary age. Um, and we were, uh, been married, you know, a handful of years. And it was little bitty kids. Finances were tough, as, as you know, I'm sure they are for, for everybody when they have little kids and you're trying to work through things. And so you, you know, you get on a tight budget, work two or three jobs to make ends meet. But that was kind of life we lived. Three kids, finances were tight. But we want to make sure our kids, you know, had great memories and stuff growing up. And so Oftentimes, Bri and I found this little fun exercise. And so if you're on a tight budget, uh, I highly recommend this, especially if you've, it really only works with preschool and elementary kids. After this, they kind of get wise up to it, but it works great with a preschool elementary. So, you know, every now and then, Bri and I would take our three kids to the 99 cent store. And we'd walk into there and we'd look at our three kids and we'd show them the whole story and go, listen, you guys can get any item in this store that you want. And they would look at us and go, what? Any item in this store, there is nothing in this store that is off limits. And their eyes would get wide. You mean anything, dad? Anything, son. Anything you want, it's yours. And all of a sudden, they would run through the store, right? And they'd all find an item. And they would just, they come up, dad, can we get two items? Get two items, absolutely. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And y'all, they would come home. And on those days, y'all, we live like kings in the days of old get that item, get that item. And they put it up there, you know, the total was $5.84. And oh my goodness, dad. But it's that, that moment when you tell a little kid, get whatever you want to in this store. It is almost too good to be true, but they don't stop and ask questions. Well, how are you going to pay for this, dad? Or why are we doing this? They just go, anything? Yes. And they're off. And I think that's what it means when, when the scripture talks about faith like a child. It's like when, when you go grace, by faith, it's going, wait, wait, Jesus went to the cross for me. Yep, while I was still a sinner. Yep. And there's nothing I need to do to, to work for it. I know I don't deserve it. There's nothing, it's not a three step process. I need to make sure I check these boxes. No, by grace through faith. And it's one of those concepts that feels a little too good to be true. But what it means to have faith like a child is just to go, I accept it. I don't quite understand it, but I'm trusting not in my mind, but in my Redeemer, Jesus. And this is what Ruth and Naomi understood, that Boaz was the family redeemer. They acknowledged that they had a problem, they needed provision, they needed protection. She approaches with complete humility, I am your servant, now with entitlement, and then just accepts it and just waits for Boaz to do what only Boaz can do. It's the same with our redeemer, Jesus. To acknowledge you and I have a problem, it's called sin. 
that we need provision, that we need protection. And the only answer is on our Redeemer, Jesus. And to approach him with complete humility and surrender and submission and to accept his grace and redemption through faith. Now, let me just talk to a certain segment in, in, in the room today. And this the segment in the room here today that you're here, you would say you're not a Christian Maybe you're agnostic. Maybe you're just kind of unsure. Maybe you're just here because somebody invited you. Maybe you're here that you've had a really bad upbringing in church. Maybe you're skeptical about preachers like me and churches like this. And if that is you, if you're sitting here today or you're watching online, I have a huge amount of respect for you. The fact that you go, Chris, I'm a little skeptical. I'm still wrestling with it. But the fact that you are here today there's a massive amount of respect because it means it says you're humble enough at least to go, listen, I know I'm missing something. I know I'm looking for something. Somebody invite me to this place. I'll see what it is about. And if that is you here today or you're watching online, I just, I care deeply for you. I have been praying for you and you just need to know that without a shadow of a doubt, I just got to be as clear as I possibly can because if we never meet uh, ever again, you never step foot in these doors again. I just need you to understand that our Redeemer is Jesus and you need him. I just got to be as clear as I possibly can say about that. Our Redeemer is Jesus and you need him. That is as clear and as truthful and as honest as I can be with you. He is our Redeemer and you need him. Now, what you choose to do with that information is totally up to you. It is my job to clearly communicate the truth. And the truth is Jesus is our redeemer. You and I are sinners in desperate need of a savior. You need Jesus. Now there's a couple of things that, that you can do. You can reject that idea and go, ah, that's, that's crazy, Chris. You can think about it. You can walk out of here and, and mull over that and go, that, that's interesting. You can ponder on it. Or you can acknowledge, yeah, I'm, I'm a broken individual. I've got it all together on the outside, but I'm a broken individual and to approach Jesus with complete submission and humility and to accept his redemption and salvation by faith. Our redeemer is Jesus. You need him. So here's the question, the follow-up question, that information. What's your next move? What's your next move? Now, most of the time at the end, I go, bow your head and close your eyes and I'll lead you through a simple prayer. I'm gonna say, no, keep your heads up and keep your eyes wide open and I'm just gonna be crystal clear. Jesus, our Redeemer, your sinner in need of a Savior, and you can accept him by faith, by acknowledging your sin, by coming into him in complete humility and surrender and submission and just saying today, Jesus, I accept it. I don't understand it all, but by faith, I accept your redemption. And you walk out of here a new man or a new woman in Christ. That's the good news of Jesus. This is the good news for Ruth and Naomi, is that they were, they were broken, they were lost, they needed provision, they needed protection, and the Redeemer stepped in. They acknowledged their need for a Redeemer, they approached him with complete humility and accepted what the Redeemer would do. That's what Jesus is for us, our Redeemer. The question is, is what's your next move? Now, for the rest of you in the room, the other part of the population, and those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus, he is your Redeemer, you've accepted his salvation, his grace through faith, you're going, Chris, what do I do with all this information? I'm gonna finish out of Colossians chapter one and I'll give you just one simple idea today. Colossians chapter one, verse 11 through 14. This is Paul writing to the church at Colossae. And if anybody understood redemption, it would be the apostle Paul to go from, from murderer, persecutor of Christians to the preacher of Jesus Christ, good news, planting churches. That is a full story of redemption. And this is what Paul says, Colossians chapter one, verse 11. He says, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. Don't miss this. Always thanking the father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to you, his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, don't miss this, who purchased or who redeemed our freedom and forgave our sins. He says, may you be filled with joy. May you be in complete gratitude and with thankful hearts. 
And you can almost get this sense as Paul is writing it, the fact that he saved us from the kingdom of darkness, placed us in his kingdom of light. He purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. And if you've accepted the redemption of Jesus Christ, and here's what I would encourage you to do today, simply this, is to be awestruck of the redemption that you have received. Be awestruck of the redemption. When I say awestruck, I mean your mind is blown. There's humility, there's gratitude, there's joy, there's a little bit of, I can't quite comprehend it, but to leave here in awestruck, because if you and I leave this room today and our hearts and minds aren't turned and focused on Jesus, then I would ask the question, what are we doing? If we're just going through the motions and playing games and just we come in here and sing a few songs, Chris made us laugh when our kids got watched for an hour, we get a free cup of coffee and go to lunch. It's a waste of your time and it's a waste of my time. But if we would come in here and reorient our hearts and minds and focus on Jesus and to resubmit and to resurrender our lives and will to him and to be awestruck at his grace and mercy, the fact that he went to the cross for you and for me, then this moment together, it's a powerful moment. It's a reminder of our redemption. It's a resetting of our hearts for gratitude and for joy and to be awestruck of that redemption that we have received. And so today, we're going to be reminded of that redemption that we have received. We're going to celebrate communion. The wafers represents the body of Jesus that was broken for you and for me. The, the little cup of juice represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for you and for me. And so today, before we take communion, I'm just going to ask that you would go before the Lord in prayer. And maybe, just maybe, it's been a minute since you've been awestruck by that redemption. Maybe you've taken it for granted. Maybe you felt a little bit entitled. Maybe there is some sin you need to confess. But just in this moment, in the quietness of your hearts and souls, just to get your heart right and to be an awestruck of our Redeemer. Jesus forgives for taking our redemption for granted, for feeling that we're entitled to it, that we've lived a somewhat good life. So we kind of have three steps ahead. Lord, we are all broken, sinful people in desperate need of a redeeming Savior. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb and the hope and the freedom that it means. We love you, Jesus. I'm grateful. Ask these things in your name. Amen. You can open up the little wafer. The fact that you and I are invited to partake in this moment. It's not just a little wafer. It represents the body of Jesus that was broken for you and for me. And to remind us of the redemption that we have received through him. We take it in honor of Jesus. And again, the cup of juice that you and I are invited to partake in represents his blood that was shed for you and for me. Because when that blood shell, there was forgiveness, there was redemption for you and for me. And so we take it in honor of Jesus. Listen, I don't, don't know what your story is. I don't know what you need, but at the end down here, we're gonna have a team of prayer partners that would love to pray with you about whatever you're going through or struggling with. If you accept the redemption of Jesus for the very first time today, would you come down front and tell me, tell one of our prayer team, we'd love to cheer you on, answer any questions you may have. I cannot thank you enough for being here today. You're an amazing group of human beings. Um, just a quick PSA, paper plates do have metal on them. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.